All right. Well, praise the Lord. I, did I turn that on or did I just turn it off? I think I just turned it off. All right. <laughs> we'll get it sorted out here this morning. Well, we are continuing our series in Acts, and we are jumping forward a little bit here to Acts chapter 20. Uh, so you did not go into a coma and miss a couple of messages. Uh, we, are starting to, we are starting to jump forward here just a little bit uh, as we go. And um, we've only got um, really, I think, six more messages here out of Acts um, before we're going to conclude the series, um, including this one. Um, and so we're coming down the home stretch uh, of the book of Acts. Um, we're going to end then, we're going to have a communion service, um, and then uh, our Easter service uh, after that. Uh, and then we're going to start our new series, which uh, I'm excited to tell you uh, all about. We'll have some announcements uh, regarding that here just in a couple of weeks. Um, but today, so today's not the final message. The title of the message this morning is Finished with Joy, uh, but we're not finishing Acts. <laughs> we're, we're, we're this, what's in view this morning uh, is the end of Paul's last missionary journey. And um, he had three. It depends a little on how you count it. The end of the second kind of bleeds into the beginning of, of the first. So some people count those uh, a little differently. And then you have some who will count his journey to Rome as a fourth missionary journey. Because, of course, he went uh, preaching along the way and people got saved along the way. And then in Rome, he uh, wrote a lot of letters and had guests and did some gospel preaching, of course, in Rome. Uh, but regardless, this is the end of his last uh, sort of intentional missionary trip. And, and it's, it's interesting. It's not stated explicitly for us here in the text, although we get a number of hints towards it, uh, that the apostle realizes that, that this is coming to a close, that he's reaching the end of his ministry, and he's beginning to think about that. Oftentimes, people don't seriously think about their legacy they don't think about how it is they want to be remembered until the finish line is really in view. Until they're in the closing maybe years of their life and they start, or you get a, you get a diagnosis of cancer or something awful. And then people start to think about how am I going to be remembered? I want to challenge you this morning to think about those things, even if you don't feel like the finish line's in sight. Because A, we just don't really know. Life is just shockingly sometimes uncertain. And so now is a good time to be thinking about how you're going to finish because, or what, what the end of that race, what do you want it to look like? When people think about your life in the future, what do you want them to remember? What kind of difference do you want to have made? I, uh, you know, there was some discouraging news this week in Christendom about, um, you, know, you know, a famous uh, preacher who did a bunch of really bad stuff. Just awful. And his whole legacy is ruined now. It's all, it's all ruined. There are thousands of hours of preaching and teaching that's really excellent material. Would, would really help a lot of people. I was thinking... Some of that stuff we could have played for our teens. We could have used some of those materials and resources, and I think it would have helped people. And we won't be able to use any of it now. It's all shipwreck and loss. And that's a sober thing to think about, because, you know, he died and nobody knew all that stuff about him, and it came out afterwards. And it's still, it's, it's ruined all of it. It just makes me really sad. <laughs> but it's a challenge to us to think about how are we going to be remembered? What are we leaving behind? Are we going to finish our race with joy? And so whatever amount of time you think you have left, I want to challenge you to take this really seriously, if you would, this morning. There was a really interesting study. I remember um, reading about it. It was uh, Stanford or somebody did it, and they, were, they wanted to 
um, just sort of do this long-term study. It was like a 10-year study that they did, and they got a bunch of participants of all different ages. They got, uh, they got some teenagers, and they got some young adults, and they got some people, you know, in, the, in their middle ages, and then they got some elderly people, and they all agreed to the survey method where they would text them at random times, like during the week. And they, and they agreed to get like a text message every week at some random time that they would reply to right away. So that was like the study, right? So the questions that they asked these people were things like, if right now you had the chance to go see this concert or go visit grandma, which would you rather do? Or if you had the chance to spend an hour with a dead relative that you never got to know, or if you'd rather go spend an hour with this celebrity, which one would you rather do? right? And then they were collecting these results. And, and for a couple of years of the study, the results they got were exactly what they expected. That the younger folks said they wanted to go to the concert, they wanted to meet the celebrity, they wanted to go skydiving, they wanted to, you know, have the experiences and the new things and do that stuff. And the older folks, as they got older, they were more inclined to spend that time with the family or get to visit with the relative that they didn't get to know or those sorts of things. And so they're building all this data and it's all kind of what they expected. And then the airplanes hit the world towers in the Pentagon. And on September 11th, everything flipped, or not flipped exactly, but all the young people, when they were asked those questions, all the young people started to say, well, I'd like to spend some time with my family. And I'd like to get to know that relative I never got to know. And so they were very surprised at this. And as they looked at the data, they came to a conclusion, which was not what they expected. And it was that it's not just that as people get older, they value legacy and family more. It had to do with how likely do you think it is you're going to die. And that the closer you felt you were to death, the more you cared about legacy, the more you cared about family, the more you cared about the impact you were making in the world. And the further away you thought death was, the more you cared about experiences and new things and having a good time. But none of us know how close we are to death. And now, it doesn't matter how far away it is, and God willing, we're all just going to hear the trumpet and go together. <laughs> but, wh but whenever that is, I don't want to get drugged across the finish line into heaven. I don't want to be carried on a stretcher through the pearly gates. I want to sprint into Jesus' arms. It's cold outside when we let Champ, our, our dog, he's a little miniature schnauzer, when we let him in from the cold, he comes bounding in and he goes straight for Hugo, my son, and hits him just like this. The other day I let him in and he came springing in and just about knocked him over on the couch. And it was really funny. Uh, <laughs> I laughed. Uh, but I just thought, that's how I want to meet Jesus. I want to sprint in there so fast that I knock him backwards a half step. Acts chapter 20, if you back up with me, I'll just look at verse 15 together. Let's read just the first few verses, and then we'll pray and we'll get started. Acts, oh, that is just wrong up there, isn't it? I did not change that. Acts, but so we're in Acts chapter 20. Ignore what's on the screen. Uh, Acts chapter 20. Um, look with me, if you would, there. Um, let's start at verse 16. Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus, because he would not spend time in Asia. For if he hasted, if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. He's in what we would call Turkey today. He's in Asia Minor. Ephesus is there on the coast. He wants to get there and then sail from there to get back to Jerusalem in time for the Feast of Pentecost. Okay, verse 17. From Miletus, he sailed to Ephesus, about 63 miles. And he got there and he called the elders of the church. And they were come to him. He said to them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia... After what manner I have been with you at all seasons. You know what manner of man I am. You know how I live. You've had a front row seat to my life. He's getting ready to say his goodbye. He says later in the text, you're not going to see my face in this life again. But you know me. You know my manner of life, the way I have been with you at all seasons. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this portion of Scripture. We thank you for these next few moments that we have, God, to look into your word. Um, God, I just, I need your help so, I need it so much. Lord, I, this is all a waste if you don't speak. And we just, we want to hear your voice. We've got your word, so we know that you're going to speak. God, please help us to hear it. And not just hear it, but God, to apply it. That this would not just be a day where we added some knowledge, we learned some interesting things, but God, that it'd be a day when we were changed, when you gave life in the place of death. God, help us to be mindful of the way that this all ends so that we can live in light of that today, so that we can finish our course with joy. Thank you for the joy that's set before us. Thank you that ultimately you're the one that is our hope and our security. But God, we want to do a good job. We want to run a good race. Help us to follow you closely. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got a bulletin on your way in this morning, there are some blanks in there and some of the cross-references and things that we're going to be looking at. If you'd like, you can follow along in that. If you're watching the live stream this morning, we attach this bulletin uh, to that newsletter we send out on Saturdays. You can download and print it out so you can follow along. If you're watching the live stream and you don't get the newsletter and would like to, uh, just contact us through the church website. We'd be glad to send it to you. We promise not to spam you. All right. So this morning as we go through and fill these blanks in, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 16, we begin here with this desire to return to Jerusalem. And Paul here is talking about the fact that, I mean, he's stopping at Ephesus. And uh, from the context, it appears that he probably spent uh, some time at Ephesus. He was there for longer than just a day. He, he spent longer than that there. We're not certain how long, but, but that's not his final destination. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And so the, the missionary journeys of Paul, his first one, we read about in Acts chapter 13 and 14, and that was a very short journey. He started in Antioch. That was our very first missionary sending church there at Antioch uh, in today what we would call Syria. And he went on a short trip through Turkey, just through a couple of cities up in there, Lystra and Derby, and then back to Antioch to give the report. Uh, after the success of that, Paul launched on a much more ambitious missionary journey. Today, we call that his second missionary journey. You read about that primarily in Acts chapter 16 through 18. <clears throat> From that point, because he went down to Jerusalem, they had the big controversy over circumcision and the meat offered to idols and all that. So he's down in Jerusalem for that. And from there, he, out of Jerusalem, he launches on the next one. Then he goes, tries to go back through Asia. And the Holy Ghost says no, keeps pushing him west, west, till he hears the Macedonian call. The man of Greece says, come over and help us. So he goes over, the gospel uh, gets to Europe uh, and reaches really the Gentiles in a capital G sort of way. From there, he goes back to Jerusalem and then back to his home base in Antioch, which is where the third missionary journey begins. Here's a map. Uh, of that. The third missionary journey, which is really in Acts 18 and 20. So we're catching the end of the third missionary journey here. So from Antioch, he goes up to Ephesus. That's one of the first places he went. Then from Ephesus, sailed over to Thessalonica. From Thessalonica down to Corinth. And then from Corinth back up to Thessalonica. Then over to Philippi, which is sort of cut off on the screen there. And then back down to Ephesus. And that's where we're at now. Ephesus, and he's getting ready to go from Ephesus down to Jerusalem where he wants to get in time for Pentecost. And this is significant because on this, this third missionary journey of his, he's going to hit a couple of these key churches. If you recognize those names, it's either because you're paid really good attention in geography or <laughs> you recognize those names from your Bible. Uh, these are some of the major churches that are later going to get letters written to them that are now in our New Testament, letters that were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul understand this, certainly wrote many, many letters. But a few of them were directly inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, where God gave him not just the ideas, not just the thoughts, but the very words that he wanted written down. And he wrote those, but those letters were initially, even though they're the direct words of God, were directly initially 
to these specific churches. And so that's kind of a cool thing. So he's going through and he's visiting those. And then for some of them, some of these letters, he maybe wrote at Ephesus. And the rest of them he wrote from prison in Rome to those churches. Okay. So Paul apparently here has some idea by the Holy Spirit about the trouble that's about to befall him at Jerusalem. Which is true. We, we know the benefit of hindsight. When he arrives in Jerusalem for Pentecost, they're going to arrest him. They're going to accuse him of a lot of things. And they're going to put him in chains and send him to Rome. And it's going to be a harrowing journey to Rome. They're robbers and the ship's going to sink and poisonous snakes. And we'll get to some of that in the next couple uh, of messages. But even though he knows that this is true, he has, or at least he has some sense of this. I just want you to note here in verse 16, it says, for he hasted. He was still, even though he understands that this is the kind of the end, it's winding down. He knows that God wants him to go to Jerusalem. And even though that's kind of the end, he's not dragging his feet. He's hasting to go. Next, we see the local church elders in verse 17. If you'll look at that with me, it says, And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church. So he gets to Ephesus, and he calls the elders. Now, we've been talking about elders some here at church a little bit lately, uh, since uh, we ordained uh, Pastor Farouk as an elder of the church. And we kind of tried to explain a little bit about what that is. You know, the elders, um, you know, past, uh, all elders pretty much are pastors, not all pastors are elders. Uh, an elder is an extra layer of responsibility. They have some ownership and responsibility for the running of the church beyond just feeding the flock, beyond just you know teaching and preaching. Now they have some responsibility for the oversight of what's going on. And we'll see some of that actually in the text here this morning. Some of the reason we believe that about elders is right here actually in Acts in our text in just a moment. But, I, but the thing I want to highlight first about this is that when he gets there, he calls the elders of the church. They didn't have to send to another city to get the elders of the church. When Paul got to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church, they didn't have to say, well, give us a couple weeks while we go get the guys from Jerusalem or from Antioch or from Philippi or Corinth or anywhere else. Where were the elders of the church? They were at Ephesus. That's not a coincidence. <laughs> The, the elders belong to a local church. Now, <laughs> th this is, in Christendom, a little bit controversial. Not all Christians believe this, but I would just like you to see that if here in our text, it's very plain. And if you'll study your Bibles in Acts, it's very clear. And I believe in the entire New Testament, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that every church has its own elders. That the, that the, the authority for each church is present in that church. And so this is the thing where, where some churches today, larger denominations, the, the final authority for that church is not local in that church. There's, there's a hierarchy where the pastor maybe of the local church reports to somebody with a different title that's in charge of a region and that guy who's in charge of that region then has to report to somebody who's maybe over that country and then, you know, in the case of like, for example, the Catholic church, not only is there somebody over, you know, there's the local guy, there's the regional guy, there's the national guy, then there's the guy at Rome who's, over, who's responsible for that entire area, right? Y'all with me on that? But other denominations have varying degrees of that also. And I just, want, I just want to say to you this morning, you just don't see that in the scriptures. Paul goes, calls for the elders of the church, they're right there. They're all local churches. That's one of the reasons in Spokane Baptist, we... We, we don't even belong to any Baptist denominations. This is it. This, this, there's, it goes from the elders that are here straight to Jesus, and that's it. That's, that's the extent of the flow chart. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I've actually had an opportunity just yesterday to, to use this. And one of the reasons I want to talk to you about this is not to be divisive or mean, <laughs> It's that this actually, there's kind of a neat soul winning opportunity that I got just yesterday uh, out of this because I was talking with somebody, a family member, extended family member. And as we were, as we were just visiting, one of the things that we were talking about is how institutions go bad. Have you ever noticed that institutions go bad? 
And the bigger they are, the badder they go. Like, why is it that republics don't last very long? Do you know that America is the gold medalist for the longest lasting republic? No republic has ever lasted as long as the U.S., as America's has. Do you know that we're coming down the home stretch on the American Republic? Why, why do big churches go bad? Why do the big denominations go bad? Why do governments go bad? Why do big companies go bad? There's something about once you accumulate too much power and too many people, there's too much momentum. People start justifying bad things to try to save the institution. And they say, but look at all the people it'll hurt if this comes out. And so they cover stuff up. And some of those people, listen, I want to say to you this morning, some of that instinct, I understand it. I, I'm not just here to hate on them. That, that, that instinct of, but it's going to hurt so many people. Like, I understand that instinct. But it's bad. Lies are always destructive. Church, hear me. Lying kills we have to live in truth. We have to live in the light. We have to, if we want to be followers of Jesus Christ. You have to live in the light. So one of the cool things about having a very flat power structure and having, having something that's not a big institution is that if it goes bad, it'll burn to the ground. And that's what you want to happen. As human beings, we have this idea that, well, we want the institution to survive even if things have gone wrong. No, no, you, you really don't. You want, it, you want it to get smashed into pieces and somebody to come build something better in its place. Listen, if this church goes bad, I don't want to be able to make the mortgage payments. Let's leave the building to somebody that's still going to preach a clean gospel of Jesus Christ. If this is not a gospel preaching church anymore, then what are we paying the electric bill for? Do you understand? If the gospel goes out, if the spirit of God departs, let it die. So, we don't want it to go bad. <laughs> you, 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 don't misunderstand me this morning. I, I, I am motivated that as long as the God will give me breath, that this will be a gospel preaching church that loves Jesus and loves its Bible and loves broken people. And, and as much as we can, we're going to try to pass that on to the next generation. Whoever the next set of elders are, if the trumpet doesn't blow, come quickly, Jesus. But if the trumpet doesn't blow, then whoever takes over, I want them to be a gospel preacher that loves Jesus and loves their Bible and loves broken people. But if that, for some reason, stops being the case, then close it down. Don't bring the money in from Mississippi or Missouri or whatever or, or find new preachers to send in and keep this thing going. If it's dead, unplug it. Whew, that wasn't <laughs> really in my notes. <laughs> but listen, I'm telling you, when you're talking to people, when you're, this is a soul winning thing. Listen, if you're a member of this church, if you're a part of the church family here, and, you're and people want to talk to you about like the awful things that some Christians have done, you tell them, yeah, we know that Christians can go bad and Christian institutions can go bad. That's why at our church, our pastor says... We don't want money or connections to anywhere else because we want it to fail if it goes bad. And that's what I got to talk to this person about is like, hey, if it goes bad, we want it to go away. And they were kind of like, right? Because the world is interested in power and in keeping things going and keeping up appearances. As Christians, we ought to be interested in the truth. That was all extra this morning. No charge for that extra preaching. <laughs> all right. So in verse 18 and 21, we find Paul's ministry testimony. I'll get back on target here. Uh, Acts 20, 18 to 20, Paul is going to talk about his testimony. And uh, one, of the things, uh, one of the things I love the best about those ladies' luncheons that they're doing is having some of those ladies share their testimonies. They have been powerful. Uh, I heard great things about the testimonies that got shared on Saturday. They record them. Listen, ladies, if you missed it, if you're still social distancing, you can't come to those things. They're recorded. They're available on YouTube, right? I mean, we'd probably have to send you the link. You got to get the link. So ladies, don't panic. Um, you're, not, you're, not, you're not famous yet. 
Uh, but so listen, if you missed it and you want it and you want to hear those testimonies, ladies, or, or I mean, like they've been a blessing to me. I've watched the past ones. I just got started on Virginia's and that's all the, I made it about 10 seconds into Virginia's. That's all the further I made it. Um, but I heard great things about both of them. Thank you, ladies, Robin, Virginia for sharing. If you want those testimonies are powerful. They're powerful because they get to, you get to hear somebody's story. Cause a lot of times you just see the turtle up on top of the fence post. In, you know it didn't get there by itself. It's exciting to hear how that happened. And so Paul is rehearsing some of that. He's thinking about his testimony here as he comes down the home stretch. Look at verse 18. And when they were come to him, so here come the elders, and they were come to them, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons. I mean, it's been years now from the first missionary journey through this region in Asia, through the second journey, now here on his third journey. He's already been in Ephesus. He's traveled around. Now he's come back. This is at least his third or fourth visit to the city. They have seen Paul in many different circumstances. He says, you know me. And the thing that he highlights, first of all, about this is his consistency and reliability. Now, he's not bragging here. He's, he's setting the table for them about what it takes to have a good testimony. And that's what I want us to try to understand from the Apostle Paul as we look at his testimony this morning, that we understand from his life and how that can apply to our lives, what does it take to finish with joy? <clears throat> what kind of testimony do we want to have? And he starts out with the consistency and the reliability of it. From the first day I came to Asia, and now here he is in his last day in Asia, and he's been there in all kinds of seasons, not just in fair weather, not just during the good times, but during the hard times too. Some of the time he spent in Asia, he spent being left for dead outside of cities. He spent it in the stocks, in prison at midnight. He spent it in, on trial and being accused. And he spent it baptizing new converts and having whole crowds come out to hear him preach and people getting saved by the dozens and jailers getting saved. All kinds of seasons. To have a testimony, I would challenge you that you need to start with this. To know, to have people know you, not just in one way or in one situation, but in different ways and in different situations. Part of the reason Christian fellowship is so important is that we not just know each other on Sunday mornings, but that we know each other in other circumstances and other contexts. Do you know that you're not just supposed to be a Christian on Sunday mornings? Uh, I'm going to talk some about my parents uh, in this message. Um, my parents did not do uh, everything right raising me. Obviously, they did a pretty good job. <laughs> no, and, and my parents, but over the course of raising me, they changed things a number of times. I remember a few times I sat my sister and I down. They said, hey, we've been doing it like this, but we learned in Sunday school that that's not really right. So now we're going to change. And we're going to do it this way. And my sister and I were like, where, <laughs> like, you know, you don't really have any frame of reference for that sort of thing as a kid. You know, you don't realize how weird that is uh, until you're older. But one of the things that I always say when I talk about my parents is this. They were the same people on Sunday morning at church as they were on Thursday afternoons at home. It was the same. I uh, hurt my shoulder and I had to go see a guy and he's working on my shoulder. And uh, we got to talking about Jesus because you know how I is. <laughs> and... Uh, and he said, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, but my parents were different people at church than they were at home. And that was sort of the end of that. Do you know how sad that is? I mean, he was around, I assume, gospel. I mean, I don't know what kind of church it was, but the hypocrisy of his parents ruined that for him, that opportunity that he had, those lessons he was learning in Sunday school, because kids will do this. And some of you I know, some of you I know have this exact experience. Listen, if, you, if mom and dad are a hypocrite, what's, that kid will just figure the pastor is the same way. That, oh yeah, he's nice at church, but I'll bet he yells and screams and throws things at home too. Be flawed, be broken, just be honest. Be, be consistent about 
If you're, if you're that way there, be that way there. And one of the ways that we do that is by being around people, different seasons, different circumstances. They get to see how you are. Listen, I had to get right with God over how I play Monopoly. <laughs> because I enjoy winning Monopoly a lot. And it turns out, I think God expects me to be a Christian even when playing Monopoly. Some of you are unsure about that. Okay. <laughs> Consistent and reliable is a key part of our testimony because otherwise that inconsistency destroys the testimony. Secondly, in verse 19, he talks about serving with humility. Look at verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. Paul, I'll remind you, was caught up to heaven to see the resurrected Christ. Heard unspeakable things. He withstood Peter to his face. This is the guy who was bold enough to go to Jerusalem and to say to Peter to his face, you done messed up. This is the guy who was thrown into prisons for throwing demons out of girls who, who, uh, who whipped mobs into frenzies, not intentionally, but by preaching the gospel to them, who went hauled into court to put, put on trial for his life, said, I want to tell you about Jesus. I mean, this is Paul. But the way that he served was not as the guy who had planted the most churches in Asia. The way he served and the way he interacted with people was one who was a servant with humility of mind. Now, if he said this to the Ephesus elders and it wasn't true, they would have known that that's not him. They'd been like, are we sure we're talking about the same Paul? Right? I mean, so this is a little awkward because it's coming out of Paul's mouth, but I want you to know that, that this, is, this is true. And they knew that. He's, remember how this started. You know me. You know that I serve humbly. There was no job that was too humble for Paul to do. When they, when they ran short of funds, he made tents to sell them. He didn't say, well, I'm too good for that. I, I'm, I'm the preacher. Somebody else go earn some money. He went to work. I'm just telling you, there's no such thing as a pastor or an elder who's too good to clean a toilet. There's no such thing. Some of them think they're too good for that, and they are badly mistaken. Serving with humility is his testimony. He wasn't there as a lord over the churches. He was there to serve. It reminds me of Jesus. Verse 19, the second part of it, he says, Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. You recall it up to this point, most of the persecution has come from God's own people, from, from the Jewish people. But he says here, with many tears and temptations, with tears and trials. Now, the word temptation there is uh, uh, parasamas, <clears throat> and it means a trial or a proving. Most often in the Bible, when we read about temptations, we're talking about the temptation of sin. It's the same word, parasamas. It's the same word, the temptation to sin. But if, you, but if you look at that word, you'll see that mostly it has not to do with sin. It has to do with testing, with proving something out. And so the word is used to describe like, you know, the, like when the devil tempted Christ in the wilderness. It's the same word. But sometimes it just refers to times of difficulty. And I think that's primarily the sense here that Paul is speaking here with his tears and his temptations. Now, say amen. Of course, Paul faced lots of temptations to sin. Of course, of course he did. But he also just went through just trial after trial where the temptation was maybe not to like sin in some sort of gross way as much as it was to just quit. To just lay down, curl up into a ball and be done. That's what he's talking about here. Tears and trials. That's an interesting thing to get into your testimony. Generally, when the world wants to say, like if you get onto any website and you look at their board of directors or their CEO or whatever, you know, the people that are like up front, you know, and they, they want to tell you about them, you get their, their biography, their testimony, kind of if you will. <laughs> it's all good stuff. Or if there's something bad, they just want to tell you about that so that you can see how they overcame that. 
But here, Paul's talking about all his tears and temptations. We generally wish for fewer tears. When we pray, we ask God for fewer trials. But to the Apostle Paul, these were the key marks of his testimony. He was not in this Christian thing for comfort. He did not do this to earn money or to become famous. It was an enormously costly road that he walked. But it was still worth it. But a mark of it was the tears and the trials. When you think about your testimony, how important are the tears and the trials? We like the triumphant parts. But I'll suggest to you, if I may this morning, that like the Apostle Paul, some of the most powerful parts of your testimony are not the parts where you did awesome. It's the parts where you wept. Verse 20, he talks about openness and honesty. This, of course, relates to consistent and reliable, but it's a little bit different. Open and honest, verse 20, he says, And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and I have taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul was a truth teller. Elder John brought such a powerful message uh, last Wednesday on living not by lies and just how important in an era where people don't even believe in truth anymore as it is Christians that we live by the truth that we believe in it, that we speak it, and that we live that way. We are surrounded by lies. There is so much falsity. We've got to be truth tellers. It doesn't mean mean, but it does mean open, and it does mean honest. Paul told the truth. He told the truth about God, He told the truth about himself. He told the truth about human nature. The truth telling got him beaten. It got him thrown in prison. It got him tossed out of cities. But he still told the truth publicly. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, he faced incredible consequences for telling the truth publicly that you could be forgiven for thinking, I'll keep telling the truth. I'm just going to do it quieter. But this guy (laughs) just keeps, anytime he gets a platform and a crowd, starts telling the truth. (laughs) Praise the Lord. But not just publicly, he did it house to house too. The message didn't change based on where he was. It was always just whatever the truth was. He says, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. If he knew it, and it could help them, he told them. Verse 21, we see that his message was also impartial. He had an impartial message of repentance and faith. Look at verse 21. He says, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not just Christian boilerplate here. This is really important stuff. He's saying, I testified the same message to the Jews that I gave to the Greeks. That was still controversial in some circles. There was the idea that we had like this message for the Jews, maybe, and this message for the Gentiles. Paul said, I got the same message for everybody. I'm not playing favorites. We'll tell everybody the same old gospel truths. Today, the way that we might think about this is that we don't have one message for the rich and one for the poor. We don't have one for the people that live in the country and one for the big city people. One for the cosmopolitans and one for the hicks. It's the same message. It's the same message. It doesn't matter how many college degrees or if you only graduated high school because your teachers were sick of you. It doesn't matter. It's the same message. If you're And the other way that we can think about this is the same message of repentance to the idolaters and the pagans as it was to the Jewish people of God. 
Think about that for a second. It wasn't, well, you're close to this group. Well, you're close, do a little better, and you guys repent. It's repent to both sides. Pastor Farouk said something early on when I first met him. It was really impactful to me. He said this. He said, it is harder to repent of self-righteousness than it is to repent of wickedness. Do you know that it's, that it's easier to repent of wickedness than it is to repent of self-righteousness? That's just true. It's just true. Because when you're self-righteous, what? By almost by definition, you don't think you need to change your mind. You think you are right. Whereas at least if you're in wickedness and somebody says, this is wicked, they go, yeah, I kind of know that already. <laughs> right? I mean, a lot of people are doing all kinds of stuff that they know they really shouldn't be doing. And so that message of repentance in some ways is easier to hear. But it's the same message of repentance. Listen, you cannot get right with God unless you change your mind about you can handle it. Every, it doesn't matter if you're trying to handle it by just living it up or if you're trying to handle it by establishing your own righteousness. If you're trying to handle it, you got to change your mind. You cannot handle it. You need to metanoia. You got to change your mind. Instead of having faith in yourself, you need faith in Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what your background is. Everybody needs that same message. It's an impartial message. And then in verse 22, there's this little interlude here we're going to just take here as we think about Paul's testimony. In verse 22, he talks about going bound in the spirit to Jerusalem. I don't have time to develop this very much, but I want you to see it. Verse 22, now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Do you, do you kind of catch that note of menace that's in there? Paul says, I don't know what it is, but you don't say that unless you have some idea it's bad. You ever heard someone say, I'm not really sure what this meeting's about? Yeah. <laughs> That's what Paul's saying. I got an appointment. I'm not really sure what it's about. Dot, dot, dot. He says, I don't know the things that will befall me there. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. <laughs> he says, All I know is that everywhere I've gone, I have found chains and persecution, bonds and affliction, which again is his hint that what's waiting for him in Jerusalem is bonds and affliction, chains and persecution, which is in fact what is going to happen. But I want you to know, but he's hasting to go anyway. You know who that reminds me of? It reminds me of Jesus. Before the crucifixion, he's out in the wilderness. He's traveling through Galilee, and in Luke 9, 51, it says, It came to pass, time was come that he should be received up. In other words, when it's time now, the crucifixion's drawing near, it says that Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was not tricked into going to the cross. He, steadfast, he set his face steadfastly to go there. And, I, and there's this, that, that spirit here is in Paul. He says, I, I've set my face to Jerusalem. I'm hasting to go there. Verse 24, he circles back just a little bit to kind of round out his testimony to talk about his goal. And his goal is to finish with joy. To finish with joy. So he says, I'm headed to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen there, except that everywhere I've gone, there's been bonds and affliction. And here I go to Jerusalem. And he says in verse 24, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He says, I, I may lose my life here, but that's okay. My goal is not to live a long time. My goal is to finish with joy. Do you see the distinction? Christian, what, what is it that motivates you? Is it to extend this life as long as possible? Or is it to finish with joy? Because finishing with joy, it might be better sooner rather than later. We talk about that with Pastor Asbury, Pastor Tom, who established this church. Uh, I, listen, I'm not saying, I am grieved still. Like he, he abandoned me here <laughs> and I was not ready for him to go. But he, but he went out on top of his game. 
you just come back from spiritual leadership conference, investing in me and in, in a number of you here in the next generation. He was preaching. He was teaching. He was discipling. He, he got home and sent out some counseling emails and spent some time with his wife and got his horse in the horse trailer and was headed up to Mount Spokane. He'd go ride his horse around on Mount Spokane and pray. And he was on his way to go on the mountain to pray with God when God said, come up higher and let's talk face to face this time. I mean, how are you going to do better than that at the end? On your way up the mountain anyway. I mean, woo! Right? And the horse was fine, by the way. <laughs> Sometimes I tell that story, I forget. To <laughs> I'm just telling you, the goal is not to just live a long time. The goal is to finish with joy. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, only made it to 33 years of age, but looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What's the apostle saying here? He's saying two things. One, he's saying that his goal to finish with joy, so he is unmoved by affliction. All this stuff that's happened to him in the past, all the stuff that is almost certainly waiting for him in Jerusalem, it doesn't change his course because his course isn't about having it easy. His course isn't about going a long time. His course is about finishing with joy. So all the bumps along the way are not really the point. Unmoved by affliction. And he is committed to testifying of the gospel of grace. He says, what I want to do is I want to finish with joy. I don't want to be thrown off by affliction. And I want to have this testimony that I preached the gospel of the grace of God. The good news that God is willing to save sinners. Wow. What's your goal? How do you want to be remembered? These final verses this morning, verses 25 to 27, is Paul's talking to the Ephesians about how he wants to be remembered. How, when they think of him, how he, they want, he wants them to think of him. He says in verse 25, And now, behold, I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the, gospel, preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. <laughs> Paul knows he's not going to see him again. So he's thinking about how they're going to remember him. It's a good thought. What's your legacy going to be? Pure of the blood of all men is a weird phrase. And as we read that this morning, he thought that is a weird, weird thing to say. But if you're familiar with the Old Testament, that's not quite as weird. <laughs> It harkens back to a command that God gave in the law. It's an interesting one. It's in Deuteronomy. I mean, this, this is a theme that runs through the Old Testament. This is one of my favorite examples of it. It's in Deuteronomy 22.8. God said, when thou buildest a house, when you build a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof. So God says, if you build a house, you have to have a railing, a battlement. You have to have a, you know, like a fence, right? Around the roof of your house. Did you know that God has some building instructions in the law? Some of you didn't know that. Here it is. God says, if you're building a house, you have to build a railing around the roof of your house. Now, in those days, the roofs were flat and were commonly used for, you know, in the evenings or they'd have dinner or socializing. You could go up on the roof. They dry, you know, dates and figs and things up there. So these are flat roofs. Okay. So he says, when you build a house, build a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man fall from thence. And it goes on to say, listen, if you don't build the battlements and somebody falls off and dies, it's kind of your fault. But if you build the battlement and somebody falls off, it's not your fault. Y'all with me? This, this principle runs through the Old Testament. We see it clearly here. And that's the idea here that Paul has. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says, I built a fence. Please don't jump it. If you jump the fence, I'm still pure of your blood because I warned you. Y'all with me on this? Sometimes we seesaw between, we're so worried how people are going to react to what we say that we hold back telling them something that's true. 
But then we share some guilt in them hurting themselves. Sometimes we go the other direction and we warn somebody. We say, please don't do this. I've had this experience so many times. As a pastor, one of the great heavinesses of being a pastor is just the dozens and dozens of people that I have sat with and I've shared scripture verses with them and I've pleaded with them to do the right thing and they go out and they do the opposite. And I come home and I just say to Heather, I should quit. I am a useless pastor because nobody will listen to me. And so we should find somebody that people will listen to. But that's not the Bible principle. The Bible principle is tell the truth. Build the battlement. And then you're free of the blood of anyone that jumps over it. Does that make sense? Okay. You cannot control what people will do. You cannot control how they will react. But here's what I'd like to challenge you with this morning. You can take steps to make sure you make it easy for people to succeed with Christ and make it hard for them to fail. Live your life in such a way that you make it easy for people to succeed with Christ and hard for them to fail. I really want Hugo to become a Christian. I want my son as soon as he's old enough to understand it, to decide to follow Jesus. And so I am living my life as best as I can to make it easy for him to want to follow Jesus, to make it easy for him to love Jesus. When we pray before dinner, I say, Jesus, we just love you so much. Thank you for giving us this food. Thank you for all our blessings. And when he prays and he just says, Jesus, we just love you so much. He's, the other day he said, I love grandma so much, but I love Jesus more. <laughs> and he doesn't, you know, he's, his understanding is limited, but that's good stuff. That's good stuff. I like that. That'll keep you going. But it's not just for your kids or for your spouses. It's for everybody that you know. Are you making it easy for them to succeed with Christ and hard for them to fail with Christ? It's not up to you. You can't control them, but build a fence. Charles Spurgeon famously said, if sinners must go to hell, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. I don't have time to preach the charge to the elders. So the last thing he does is he gives this charge to the elders. What he wants the elders of the church to do. He says, oversee the flock, feed the flock that's there. Remember who the owner really is. He tells them to watch for the wolves that are without. He said, wolves are going to come from without the church. And they're going to try to come into the church elders. Protect this church from the wolves that are outside and coming in. And then he says, and by the way, watch out for the wolves that come from within too. There's wolves that are going to come from inside the walls of the church. Watch out for them, elders. And then he says, cling to God and his word. How are you going to survive all the wolves? Get a grip on your Bible and on Jesus and do not let go. Okay. Let's make some application here. We got a baptism after the service. I'm super excited about that. So I got to get done preaching before the water gets cold. <laughs> Faraz, I'll love it. I, I, try to tell, I try to tell the teens, the colder the water the is, the more spiritual it is. <laughs> um, all right. So, we're, so here's the upside down. Well, let's, let's talk about the upside down values, the right side up, and then we'll be done. The upside down part of this is aiming for an easy life. So many people are aiming to have an easy life. The goal is easy. And that's not a good goal. It's upside down. Now, you don't want to make things hard on purpose. Somebody say amen to that. Please don't make things hard on purpose. <laughs> things are plenty hard anyway. Have you noticed that? Life's plenty hard anyway. But if you're trying for comfort, you are going to be continually disappointed. Because comfort is not reliable. And even if you can get comfortable briefly, it won't really make you happy anyway. Comfort, number one, is 
it's just unreliable. Comfort is very unreliable. It just doesn't last. You ever tried to get comfortable in bed and notice that is true? The only time I have ever been truly, perfectly comfortable in bed is immediately after my alarm has gone off. <laughs> yep. Exactly the right temperature, exactly in the perfect position, brunk, 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 because the devil is real. That's all I can say. I don't understand. <laughs> Comfort's unreliable. Proverbs 23, 5, Wilt thou set thine eyes on that which is not? Riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle towards heaven. You ever notice that? 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, what, When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail on a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. You can be comfortable, say, hey, everything's great, and that's when destruction shows up, and there's no escape. Luke 12, 19, I will say to my soul, soul, that was much good laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Listen, the money goes away. Trouble shows up uninvited, and death comes when we don't expect it. Comfort is not reliable. And even if you got it, it wouldn't make you happy. And even if you got it, it wouldn't make you happy. It won't. I got trapped in bed for a couple of days. Once I quit taking the meds, it was no fun anymore. It, it, just, it won't make you happy. Ecclesiastes 2, we preached on this some last Sunday. I won't belabor it, but just look at what Solomon, who got it all, what he said. I said in my heart, go to now, I'll prove thee with mirth. Enjoy pleasure. Behold, this is vanity, it's emptiness. I made great works. I built in me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. And I had great possessions. I gathered silver and gold, the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and all the delights of the sons of men. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. Then I looked on all the works of my hands had wrought and all the labor that I labored to do. And behold, all was vanity, emptiness, vexation of spirit. There was no profit under the sun. Therefore, I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Ugh. Get it all if you want. Give it a shot. And if you are one of the unfortunate ones that succeeds, you will find out that it still won't make you happy. Comfort's not reliable and it won't make you happy. So what ought we to do instead? How do we live right side up? Well, we live right side up by aiming for an eternally meaningful life. Instead of wanting things to be easy, instead of wanting them to be comfortable, we ought to have our hearts set on it being meaningful. And not just meaningful, but eternally meaningful. How are you going to be remembered? What's the legacy that you're going to leave behind? What does God see when he looks at your life? What's the final report I'm going to say from Jesus? We're going to run quickly through all the same things that Paul said about him. And we're just going to see what the scripture says is applying it to us. An eternally meaningful life is one that's consistent and that's reliable. Matthew 25, 21, the, the highest commendation. His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Christian, the highest commendation that we are going to receive from Christ, you want an eternally meaningful life? The thing that Jesus is looking for is not the preachers, necessarily. It's not the people that gave X amount of money or did this job or did that job. He's looking for the ones that were consistent and reliable. What's the message to his servant? Well done, thou good and faithful. The faithfulness is what gets praised. It's not what he accomplished. It's just the faithfulness in doing it. 
all of our gifts are different. We all have different abilities. But what Jesus is looking for is not ability as much as it is just faithfulness. Consistent and reliable. You can be consistent and reliable. And then enter into the joy of the Lord. Second is serve with humility. We all think we want to serve some great thing. Do some big thing. But the thing that matters is not being recognized. It's serving. And it's doing it just humbly. Just serving humbly. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says it like this. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud. But he giveth grace to the humble. How do we treat other people? The bosses be subject to them. Treat them like they're the boss. And you just serve. Anybody can serve with humility. And if you want an eternally meaningful life, find somewhere you can humbly serve. Thirdly, value the tears and the trials. God's been working in my heart on this for years, and I am a slow, recalcitrant student because I want the trials to stop, and you don't believe that I don't enjoy crying in public, <laughs> but I don't really enjoy it very much. But God is teaching me to value these things. And the more I think about the trials we've been through, especially with my daughter, the more I realize how eternally valuable it's all been. The things that God has done in my life and in my heart that I am pretty sure I would never have allowed God to do. I would have never let him meddle in some of those parts of my heart until my heart was broken. And once it was broken... I grudgingly allowed God access to some of those pieces. And nothing can be more eternally valuable than that. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says, Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Same word there, the trials. The manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What are we talking about? We're talking about finishing with joy. Finishing with joy when Jesus comes, having glory and honor and praise. How do you get there? Tears and trials. Do you value the tears? Do you value those trials? Washington Irving one of my favorite quotes said this, there is a sacredness in tears. They are not a mark of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are the messengers of overwhelming grief, of deep contrition, and of unspeakable love. The Bible says, weep with those that weep. Because sometimes the only thing that can be conveyed that's going to matter is just that you would sit there and cry with them. And that's it. So don't shove that to the side. Value those tears. Value those trials. Second, or what, I don't even know what number I'm on. Open and honest. It's next. We can all choose to have a life that's characterized, a testimony that's characterized by being open and just by being honest. Let's be truth tellers. Let's not lie and pretend and wear one face here and a different face somewhere else. Let's just have one face. And I know that some of, the, some of us are kind of roughed up. We got a black eye and we got some scars and we think, we're going to put the face on when we come to church, and that's maybe good somehow. 
we got to be open and honest with each other. Let's not pretend. Now be polite. Y'all understand? Be polite. Even if you don't feel like it. Be polite. I'm talking about not being a hypocrite. Okay. 1 Peter 2, 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. At the finish line, they'll say, okay, it was really true. An impartial message. Do you have an impartial message? Or are you changing it for different audiences? James 2, 1, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. It's the same message to everybody. We don't, not this to the rich and that to the poor, this to the smart and that to the dumb, this to the city and that to the country. It's just one message. Be unmoved by affliction. 2 Timothy 2, 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And why do soldiers endure hardness? Why do they eat the terrible food and sleep on the uncomfortable beds and wear the uncomfortable gear and go to the worst places in the world? Why do they do it? It's not because it's fun. They do it that they might please them who has chosen him to be a soldier. That's why we appreciate the American soldier because they weren't drafted by a king. They volunteered to serve their country. Because they believed there was something still about America that was worth defending and fighting. And so we salute them because we agree that there's still something worth defending and fighting about America. And I appreciate the people who wanted to do something for their country. And so they, went, they go through all that stuff for that reason. Thank you, veterans. Do you realize that if we have Jesus Christ as our Lord... Can we not do what a U.S. soldier would do for America? Could we not do that for Jesus? If they're willing to endure that for a flawed country, could we not do that for our perfect king? Endure hardness. Don't be thrown off because it's hard. And finally, Are we committed to testify about the gospel of grace? Paul was. His whole life was given to testify to the gospel of grace. And so the last words of his that we have written from Rome before his execution there, to to Timothy, he said this, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Raced across that finish line to see Jesus. Sister Nancy, if you're able to come and just play on the piano, we'll invite all of you, if you would, you can bow your heads, you close your eyes if you'd like. We're going to invite you here at the end of the service to take a few moments to do some business with God. We're, um, I think, hopefully, if the deacons aren't on it already, go get the kids, let them know that we're going to baptize in just a moment. We'll get them ready to go. But before we do that, before we get to the baptism, before we're dismissed from church, before we go home, whatever else is going to happen in your day, whatever is next in the week, I'd like to invite you before we're done this morning to spend a few moments and think about what it is that God might be wanting to talk to you personally about. We, we, we threw a lot of stuff up here. But I, I, I'd ask you if I could to not maybe be overwhelmed by the size of that list, but rather to just have this thought in your heart that there might be one thing that God would talk to you about, about your, about your testimony, about the legacy that you're going to leave behind, about the way that you are going to cross that finish line. And that you could say to God here in this time of quietness in just a moment that you might be able to say, God, I want to finish with joy. I want to leave the kind of legacy that's going to make it easy for others to follow Jesus and hard for that, for them to turn away. I want that for my family, for my friends. I want to make it easy because of my life to follow him. Listen, if God's speaking to you today about knowing him, we do not take it for granted that just because you're in a church building, that means that you're saved. Now, you're in the right place, praise God. 
If you're watching the live stream, good for you. But coming to church, watching church does not get you to heaven. It's not how this works. The only way to heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you sure that you're saved? Do you know for sure that heaven's your home? If you don't, you can know that for sure. You can be 100% sure. Would you let us take a Bible? Now, I don't want to give you my opinion. I want to give you the church's opinion. We'd like to show you just from the Bible how you can know that heaven's your home, that Jesus is your Savior, that he died for you personally, that all your sins have been handled. Please let us know. Today could be the day that you know that for sure. Christian, you're here, you're saved. Maybe God's speaking to you about falling into the trap of the easy life. As Christians, we do that. We, 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 I do that. Oh, so much. I, so many of my prayers have been focused on God. Would you make it just a little bit easier? And I am not against those prayers. If you've prayed those prayers, that is okay. God has invited us as his children to come and ask for the things that we need. It is okay to come to God and ask him for the bread. To ask him to help you carry the thing you can't carry. Don't misunderstand me, please. But that can't be what the goal is. That can't be what our purpose is, is just to have things be easier. Because comfort is unreliable. And it doesn't satisfy anyway. Maybe you fall into that trap of too much of your life is about trying to make things a little easier. And you could talk to God about it this morning. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart about doing about something that needs to change so that you can have an eternally meaningful life. That's going to be specific to just you. It's your course with God. It's not going to look like mine. It's not going to look like Paul's or anybody else's here. It's going to be yours. But the principles are the same. The foundation of the eternally meaningful life. Is God speaking to you about being consistent, reliable? Maybe he's talking to you about serving with humility. Maybe about valuing those tears and valuing those trials. Maybe it's about being open and honest. Not being partial. Being unmoved by affliction. Maybe there's a storm that's trying to knock you off course. Maybe it's just about being committed to testify the gospel of grace. Whatever it is, you do business with the Lord. We're going to sing a verse or two in just a moment and then baptize uh, Faraz. But you take this minute with just you and God and do some business with him.